fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, and we've got Mr. Dave North Martino. Hey. <laughs> How you doing, Al? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> but I'm still recovering from last night's uh, MRI, you know. Oh, the fun, the fun. The fun, the fun. can't believe how much uh, prep I had to go through for that, as in, you know, all the needles. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like a pincushion? Yeah. yeah. It took it took three uh, nurses to get four shots in me. <laughs> just to, just They only needed to hook me up once, but it, none of them could, could get in there, you know, <laughs> how it goes. I guess maybe I'm getting old. They can't find the vein. Right? Can't find a vein anymore. Yeah, tough, you know. Hey, and Ryan <laughs> O'Neill died. Oh, did he? Yeah. I didn't hear that one. You didn't hear that one. 82. No. 82. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so he made it a run. You know, I met him back in the 90s when he was filming something in Portland. Oh, did you? Yeah, just a short thing. It was just what I, just the work at the time I was doing. I got to meet him, but he's a nice guy. He seemed like, I don't know, maybe he wasn't, but <laughs> he, he was nice to me. And a lot of people don't remember him, which has kind of surprised me, but I guess a yeah. lot of his stuff was 60s, 70s, right? Yeah, now. that's true. That's true. Paper Moon and Love Story, Peyton Place yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So that's, you know, a little bit beyond, I guess. I guess you have to be a little bit more in, he has to, you have to be more your age. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you have to be older. Yeah, you have to be old. Like me. Yeah. Old like me. Yeah, yeah you were probably 20 when Peyton Place was out. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Sure. Well, you look good for being that old. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That. Yeah. <laughs> well, here we go. Now, Tate, we're going to go back in, in history today. The book is called The Combat Zone, Murder, Race, and Boston's Struggle for Justice. And we'll bring in the author and find out all about this. So, Jan Brogan, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Jan, this is um, quite the story, quite the book, d- dealing back in the 70s in Boston. Before we get into the story, what, what made you go go to this story? What made you write about it? I had gone to college in Boston, and I was a, I was a freshman in '76, and I, did, I I never went to the combat zone, which is I was I was still I think too young and probably too chicken. I never went to the combat zone, but I remember I was in college, so I remembered when this murder happened, and uh, I had just um, finished writing four murder mysteries, and I really just didn't want to write another one, and I kept saying to people, I want to find this. I know I can write a book, and and, and, and carry suspense, but I, I want to, um, I want to find a story that needs to be told. And I, I said that enough times that, uh, someone came to me and said, you know, Danny Popolo, that is the victim of the, of, of the, I mean, the brother of the victom who, who I knew, you know, cause we had daughters, um, the same age, but I, I didn't know he was connected. I, I didn't re- make a connection to the names, uh, is looking for a screenwriter. And I said, why is Danny Popolo? looking for a screenwriter. And they said, well, remember that murder, the Harvard football player? I was like, oh, yeah, that was that was his brother. And uh, so I wound up meeting with Danny, and uh, they had a director, a pretty famous director at the time, who was very interested, and they, they, they wanted me to write this screenplay on spec. And, uh, you know, I know that writing a screenplay on spec, you know, you only get paid if it gets made into a movie, which means you never get paid. So right. <laughs> I said, I will do the screenplay on spec, if I have the rights to do the book and the way I see it, because I'm a journalist, I'll write the screenplay your way. But if I'm going to write a book, I has to be, I'm a journalist. So it has to be how I see things. And we had an agreement, did an agreement. I did the screenplay and it never got made into a movie. And uh, I wrote the book. That's how that came about. So for people that are not in the area, what what, what is the combat zone? Okay. So the combat zone is a four block area in Boston. In Boston's, uh, it's called Lower Washington, in the downtown, just outside of Downtown Crossing. That's kind of surrounded by the, the 
It's near Chinatown. So it was a four block area that in the seventies, in the seventies, all cities were North, particularly northern cities were, were suffering. They were contracting. Um, all the growth was in the suburbs. People were moving out in droves. They, in Boston, they lost manufacturing. And you couldn't give away downtown real estate, really. Uh, it's hard to imagine now because Boston is so affluent and successful. But at that time, no one thought the city was coming back. This is when New York City was almost went bankrupt. And you remember those images of trash lining up in the middle of, of uh, New York City. Well, Boston was not far behind, and so all the cities, and, and remember, this is before the Internet. This is before the, D, the DVD uh, or the VCR. If you wanted to ingest pornography, you had to go somewhere and buy it. In downtowns, you know, old theaters were being turned into uh, movie houses where they were showing X-rated movies, and uh, the, in, in Boston, there was a four-block era. There was something like 37, 36 sexual establishments, you know, like strip clubs, uh, movie houses, uh, steam baths, uh, and adult bookstores were really big. And there were these, like, porn reel things where you put a quarter in and uh, you got to consume it. And, and prostitution was everywhere. Prostitution was rampant. And because the city, to deal with it, and, and all, all cities were afraid of the spread of pornography throughout their cities, so or the, the adult entertainment industry. They were worried about it. So in Boston, they figured out that if, and because of some recent Supreme Court decisions and and a state high court decision, it was becoming increasingly harder to uh, decide what was obscene and to restrict them. But uh, they found out that if they if they contained it, if they said you can only do these businesses in a four block area, then you then it's illegal everywhere else in Boston. And they could the, the, the government could do that. And so they zoned an adult entertainment district. Uh, and it originally it was, you know, it was supposed to be a form of containment. They were going to do all sorts of great things. They were going to, you know, clean it up. They were going to police it. It was going to be, you know, great. And the city, you know, the city never talked about this, but they they sort of needed the combat zone because uh, it was the draw for tourism and the convention business. So they had this this area, but the problem was they were the city was broke and negligent, and they ignored the combat zone. They did not police it. Uh, they made a few attempts to, you know, improve signage. They let them have neon. And it's the only place in the city you were allowed neon. They didn't police it. And this was in the 70s when the mob, the glory days of the mob. So uh, the mob moved right in. And, and the police corruption, particularly in that, that district, was through the roof. And uh, it quickly became crime-ridden. So that on a Saturday night in the early 70s, if you, if you went to the combat zone, you would see on one Street, LaGrange Street, there would be 60 or more prostitutes just walking the era. There was, there was sex going on in the theaters, in the bars, in the alleys. Uh, one of, one of the clubs, you know, they were certain, the drinking age was 18. They were like, you know, they weren't checking even for that. Um, it was just betting. I mean, it, it was, it, 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 it was wild and it was a four block area and it was called a, um, a drive through where the cars would come through and they would just be stopped at a gridlock. Well, you know, sex and drugs were sold through open car windows, you know, and, the, and the, the traffic would be stopped and you'd see the cops there would just look in the other way. The cops were uh, allowed to take detail work where the, the clubs hired them. So they, they sat in the bars and drank for free uh, in, the, in the bars, whether they were on, whether they were on duty or not. And uh, of course, a lot of a lot of serious crime got ignored and it got way out of hand. And, and remember, this is a a cash, you know, people go, people are going to the, to the combat zone to, you know, to a strip club or, or to buy sex or drugs. They're going to carry a lot of cash, right? So mugging and pickpocketing was like through the roof. It was the crime was just, at, it, it went up something like six fold from the 60s to the 70s. It was, it was like the Wild West, a little bit of the Wild West, but in Boston. I mean, David's from there, so you must. Did you hang out in that that zone, Dave? Yeah, I was too young. <laughs> well, this this speaking of Boston, this was very unusual for Boston, wasn't it? Because of the whole, you know, kind of puritanical uh, roots of Boston, and I, I remember always hearing "banned in Boston." Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. They, they banned Walt Whitman's "Leave the Grass," and uh, "I Am Curious Yellow." And in fact, when they decided to go this route, when they when they zoned a uh, adult entertainment industry. Like the, the whole, the rest of the country was like, what? Boston did what? <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons when this murder happened, 
It was covered by 300 newspapers across the country. It was, you know, as far away as Japan, like the Stars and Stripes in Japan, but I mean, you know, in in Las Vegas and, you know, Louisiana and Montana and uh, in Maine. I mean, everybody covered this because it was like, see, we told you, I, you know, this is this was your the solution, you know, and look what happened. Harvard boys are getting killed. So that's um, one of the reasons that the, the the crime got so much publicity and the fact that it was Harvard, which always gets a lot of publicity, and the fact that the two victims were, were white and the, the three men arrested were black. And Boston was also at the time going through busing. It was 1976. This was only six months after. There's a very famous photo during busing of uh, some white kids from Charlestown spearing a black businessman in in uh, or it looks like they're spearing him they're, they're, they've got the, the, a flag uh, a flagpole with the American flag proudly you know hanging from it and they're just about to spear a black businessman in his three priest suit who just happens to be going through city hall plaza at the time and it was called this the photo by Stanley Foreman was called the soiling of old glory and it was in the bicenten- Boston's bicentennial year. And that also went around the world, and it kind of sealed Boston's reputation as the most racist city in America. So when you go into a story like this and you start telling it, because you're dealing with Boston and Harvard and people that are still alive, how, do, how is it that people react, or how do you get information? Was there any difficulty in that? Sometimes, sometimes the years was an advantage. And sometimes they were a big disadvantage. Um, the disadvantage, where I, say, I used to say, you never do a true crime story that's like 40 years old because it's old enough that people, that people you need are, have died, and, but not old enough that not everybody has died so they can complain about, you know, complain about what you got wrong. But I was very lucky where I got this, the book received a lot of positive attention and, and not, I really haven't been called into account for anything that I wrote as being inaccurate. But one of the like the people, like the Harvard football players who were there that night, um, it was really sort of interesting because it was very traumatic, right? A very traumatic. And some of them wanted to talk about it, and it was helpful for them, and some of them wouldn't even return my phone call. But a lot of them did call. Uh, a lot of them were very generous with their time. The three, the three, the two of the defendants were dead. Uh, Leon Easterling, who's the, who's the murderer, I finally tracked him down and he wanted to talk to me. Well, he tracked me down, actually. I was asking, I thought he was dead at the time because I'd been told he was dead. And I was asking around for him on, 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 on websites. And he got back, he got back to me and said, you know, I, I'll talk to you, but you know, I'm gonna, it's gonna cost you, you know, and I said, well, you know, I'm not gonna pay for it. So, and then he did, then he did die. Uh, shortly after, not not too long after that, a couple of years after that. So the hardest part was finding people who were willing to talk about the defendants. Leon Easterling, I had his his wife, or I guess I guess she might have been his ex wife, and was willing to talk to me. I was going to go up to Maine, Vermont, to meet with her, and then she, the family talked to her, and she wouldn't she wouldn't talk to me. But I wound up finding you know bartenders who knew him and friends you know who would speak on his behalf and people who knew him really well. I mean, I, I wish I could have found more people who knew them. I was lucky to find as many as I did. But I also had tremendous resources because I had started with this screenplay and Danny Popolo had, he had uh, the, this, the transcripts from the first trial, which I think I have the only copy because they're still in my possession. I have the only transcripts from the first trial. And then the second trial, I couldn't find for a long time. I finally tracked them down to the social law library. I went in there and they... <laughs> They charge you something like a dollar a copy or 75 cents a copy, something outrageous. And it was like, a, I mean, it was a 4,000 page document. They, I, I was only able to, but it turns out they didn't have, it was on microfiche, you know, I was going to get this. So I got an app that lets you copy it. And so on my phone, I sat there, you know, for three weeks going in every day and just copying, you know, just photoing the microfiche. And it, and it, they were, they only had a thousand out of 4,000 pages, but they did have, there was an appeal. So the uh, an appeal argument, an appeal decision, actually summarizes everything. So it, it turned out I had enough, and 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 then I was also able to get all the police reports uh, because Danny wrote to the cops and they were willing to give me. So I have all the police reports, and then I also have some of the prosecutor materials, and then I the you know, some of the defense attorneys had documents for me. So in general, people were willing to talk to me, and that was a good thing. So what's the what's the premise of of what happened? that night like maybe go over the basics of the story so 
the Harvard football team had a tradition uh, after its last game of the season, which is always against Yale. It's called the game. It's a big deal. You know, everything about Harvard is tradition. And they have a, a, a breakup dinner at the Harvard Club, which if is was it which is a beautiful old brownstone. Uh, it was on Com Ave, like a gorgeous building. It's very Tony, and they they go there for a banquet, and it's very high class. Um, Ethel Kennedy was there to give uh, to meet with them and give them a um, to a scholarship award on behalf of Robert Kennedy's, you know, who had passed away. Uh, there are all sorts of classy people, and they have speeches and everything. And they end this really classy night with a tradition, and it's a tradition. To go down to the Harv- go down to the combat zone for in- to a strip club at-, at for last drink together as a team. You know they've been drinking while they're at the Har- at-, at the club, and they actually go down. Some of them go down in a Harvard van with the equipment manager. A lot of them take their own cars. They they so it's forty of them go down, and somebody's cousin was a manager, so they had a private room in the back of the Naked Eye, which was the popular was a popular strip club. They get a private show, and they're having a good time and. Some of them even get up on the stage and dance with the stripper, and the bouncer comes out and uh, tells them they they got to go. But it's closing time anyway, so they spill out into the street. Now, the, the victims, actually, uh, Tom Lincoln and, and Andy Popolo, they go straight to their – well, they go to their car. They're in a car on the way home. They have nothing to do with what happens. And that's one of the – one of the, the tra- tragedies of this is that they always get to say, well, they got what they deserve for, you know, going down there trying to get sex. But they had nothing to do with this, any of this. So there's six other Harvard football players and the Harvard equipment manager who are walking home. They go past the Carnival Lounge, which is another which is another club. It's two or three young prostitutes or women dressed like prostitutes. See, there's this there's, there's this uh, pickpocketing scheme, and it's very popular at the time. And these young women, very young prostitutes. Or, or dressed like prostitutes. They're outside. And what they do, they hang out outside the bars. And they wait for the guys to leave. And as they're leaving, they sidle up to them. It's called the fond- They fondle them. And when they distract the guy, they still steal his wallet. It was very common knowledge. It had been written about. In fact, two weeks before this murder, the police superintendent of Boston had released to the press a secret investigation he had done on his own police department because it was so corrupt. And in this secret report, a lot of things, a lot of corruption, like small and, 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 and massive, was revealed. But one of the things they talked about was this, they called it the Robert Orr scheme, where women did this and they said a new wrinkle was that now they had male protectors who were there, were there, and if, if, and if, and if a Mark complained about losing his wallet or noticed his wallet was getting stolen, the guy would step in and protect them so the prostitute could run away and he'd get a cut of the wallet. And uh, the police uh, superintendent told me that some of the cops were even in on it. They would protect the, the woman for a cut of the wallet. So this was very big. At the, it was in the news at the time. And so this, these six Harvard boys and the equipment manager are walking out. These prostitutes come out, and they start talking to them and, you know, want to have a good time and all that. And, uh, yes, yeah, so the boys in the front say, you know, get out of here because they know what's going on. And a drunk kid in the back goes, oh, I have $50 in my wallet. So they follow them to the Harvard van. And, or they get invited to the Harvard van, depending on whose testimony you you read. It ends up a girl gets in, uh, a guy loses his wallet. They chase they chase after her uh, and down the street. There's a fight, uh, a fight. You know, as at, at one when they're chasing her, these uh, three black men from the Carnival Lounge come out and come out. And they're ten- they're, there's a there's a fight, and Andy Popolo has nothing to do with this. He's like in the back of the car. Tom Lincoln is there. He gets kicked, and they they are surrounding Edward Sardis, who is one of the defendants. And he says, uh, and Tom Lincoln says, "Hey, look, he doesn't have the wallet. Let's leave." And they turn around, to, and just as they're about to go, Leon Easterling steps in and, and stabs Tom Lincoln in the in the stomach, in the abdomen, and uh, they they all of them run back to the Harvard van. As they're running, the three three men are chasing them, and this is where. Andy Popolo is, has just gotten out of his car to see what's going on, and he sees his teammates being chased back to the van. This is all he sees at this point. And he goes to the alley where they all end up, and by the time he gets there, all of the Harvard teammates are in the van, except for one of them, who is being pounded against the van. And he goes in to help him. And he winds up in a fist fight with, with Edward Soares, and uh, Leon Easterling jumps over them and stabs him stabs him in the, in the gut. 
he get a friend comes and get you know swoops in and grabs him and he's they say, he's okay so let's get out of here and they retreating they they go out of the alley towards the street to to get out of there and Leon Leisterling comes back and stabs him a second time, this time into his abdomen, up and twists it into his heart. Police are there because that corruption report had just been released and because there was a new uh, superintendent in charge, there was a, a t- there was a lot of police that night, and they were there, like, in seconds. They get Andy to the emergency room, which luckily is, like, a, a block away, a block and a half away, in under, like, five minutes and they start working on him. He arrives DOA, but they're able to restart his heart. And, and they, you know, operate on him all night. And in the morning, you know, the news is going out everywhere, right? Family comes to the hospital. And when they go to leave to change in the morning, they look out and there's TV trucks everywhere on the street. There's a press conference because it looks like he's going to live. The doctors are like, if it wasn't for the fast acting of the police. Now, remember, this is the just the much maligned corrupt police. They were just... Had their, you know, had gotten a, a, a shellacking la- the week before. Now all of a sudden they're heroes, which is obviously really good press for them. And so the story, it's a real feel good story for a day until that afternoon when he starts to seize and he, you know, it's clear he's never going to wake up from his coma. But the story, the murder is really about initially, it's about the combat zone because it's been so controversial, not in, in nationally and in the city. People want it shut down. Uh, Ray Flynn, who will become the next mayor, is there the day after with a petition to shut it down. The police swoop in on it, and, and all the prostitutes are off the streets and into the, you know, they get they, they wind up in other neighborhoods. The district attorney's office releases its investigation, into, which reveals that, you know, 50% of the, the businesses are owned by the mob. They start investigating all the straw uh, corporations that own everything and it just becomes this massive media event every day about the combat zone and andy's murder becomes wrapped up in that initially i mean the new york times is here i mean people are coming in from everywhere because it's just a very big very big deal of the moment it's all about the combat zone and how 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 foolhardy it was and um it goes to try when andy dies in the beginning of uh december it will be tried three men will be accused of a murder in the first degree. And that's uh, Leon Easterling, Edward Soros, and Richard Allen. The prosecutor will use joint venture, which is like the felony murder rule, you know, like even right. if you didn't actually wield the knife, you were there supporting him. And uh, and also the prosecutor saying you were all in it for a cut of that wallet, which also makes it a conspiracy. So he's charging all three of them with murder in the first degree, which in Massachusetts is, you know, life in prison without parole. The charges are in December. It will go to trial by March. That's like three months. Wow. Three months later, it goes to trial. And, and, and the, and the combat zone stuff is in the headlines every day because they're taking this, this bar is getting closed down for these violations. Uh, one of the, one of the clubs is charged with figuring out how to uh, let the customers pay for, you know, sex on their oral sex on their credit cards, you know? And so this, this stuff is, is, in the news all the time. And so there's really, it's, it takes them forever to impanel the jury because they can't find anybody who is not uh, inundated in publicity, who hasn't, who hasn't already formed an opinion. And, and then you add busing to that because this, these juries are coming from neighborhoods like the North, you know, the Boston neighborhoods, most of the working class neighborhoods who at this moment are furious about busing. And as one of the attorneys said, they were in no mood to consider the constitutional rights of, you know, three black men. So Henry Owen is the um, attorney representing Richard Allen. Now, so Leon Easterling is the murderer. And he even acknowledges that, you know, although he says it in self-defense. But Edward Soros was involved in some of it was in the fist fight. And, you know, you'd say he started. But Richard Allen, who is the third man who was charged, uh, he is the bouncer at the Carnival Lounge. The prosecutor includes him because he is known, and I've had this confirmed, as a protector in the zone. Uh, he gets hired for protection because he's a big man, but he actually never touches anybody. The only testimony is he's there saying, Harvard boys, like, basically, go home. You know, you're out of your league. You know, get out of here. Go home. Uh, but he also gets charged with murder in the first degree. Right. The prosecutor who is a Tom Mundy, who is a renowned, renowned prosecutor. He will go on 
to have a very admirable career. He wound up prosecuting the, in the Charles Stewart case, the younger brother, Matt Stewart, who is uh, actually uh, covering for the brother. That's the one where they where they were claiming that the wife was killed by black men when it was really the husband who did it. But he will go on to have a stellar career. Up until now, though, when they chose a jury, he is known for, and this was this happened in Boston. It happened everywhere. It wasn't just Boston. When you chose a jury, uh, when when the the lawyers, the prosecution, defense get peremptory challenges. Those are where they can say, no, I don't want you on the jury without giving a reason, right? So when you select a jury, there's a voir dire and the judge, you know, decides, okay, you know, you're not, you're not overly influenced by the publicity. You know, your father, your, your brother's not a cop. You know, you don't have any prejudices. You're okay. But then each side, the prosecution, the defense gets a chance to say, nah, I don't like him. I have a feeling he's going to be against my client. I don't like it. That's called a peremptory challenge. And because there were three defendants and they each got a ton of them, but the prosecution got 48, uh, was allowed something like 48 peremptory challenges. He wound, up, he wound up excluding, I think it was 11 out of 12 or 12 out of 13 potential black jurors, you, you know, and he didn't have to say why. And, and that was the way business was done. It was, there was case law allowing it. It was done in every state uh in every city and uh the defense used their peremptory challenges to get rid of every juror who had an italian last name because the victim was italian uh and they figured it would cause too much sympathy so what this case did was this this is the case that changed that uh it changed it first in massachusetts and then along with the california case it was used uh, by the supreme court eight years later to change federal law which no longer allowed that just blatant racism and uh, in in jury selection. In this particular case, was was the trial really all about combat zone, uh, Harvard, the cops, and racism? You mean as opposed to what happened? Yeah, like did, it, did you know what I mean? Was the battle about? Did they make it into that? Um, I don't think the trial itself, not the first trial. The first trial, I think, was influenced. I think the way they prosecuted it was influenced by what was going on in the combat zone. The way I think the, the the district attorney hated the combat zone, there was a lot of pressure, I think, in the state to get, I would. I, I think there was a lot of pressure to get convictions. I think, in my own mind, I think it was a bit of an overreach. I think it was an overreach to charge all three men with murder in the first degree. And I think that's, I think it was the, the, the publicity of the combat zone impacted the way it was prosecuted. They also had the, the judge, uh, Judge Roy, was uh, known as the hanging judge. It was defense attorneys believed he he got the case whenever the state wanted a pro- wanted a conviction. He had uh, Henry Owens, a very uh, well known black attorney in Boston, one of the few black attorneys in Boston at the time, and he's representing uh, Richard Allen, and he just gets shut down over and over again in those prosecution, like every objection. He makes gets overruled. I think I forgot the number. It's something like two hundred times in the case. The the judge obviously does not like him, and that becomes clear in the way the trial goes down. And you know the jury, I think, does get those messages. I I don't think it can help but get some of those messages. Yes, I think the combat zone influenced the trial. But that said, the prosecutor had a very strong case. He had a very strong case. There were something like thirteen or fourteen eyewitnesses. And not all of them from Harvard. We're talking about, you know, the MT, uh, the, the subway guy who's coming home from work who sees what's going on. Uh, the, you know, the electrical guy who's, you know, uh, fixing the wires or people just home. You know, there were a lot of witnesses who testified to what happened. They saw, you know, initially when the fight, the, the, the Harvard boys run after a black woman down the street to try to get their wallet, Right. And obviously, it makes sense that, you know, men would, might, other black men might come to her defense, whether they were working for a cut of the wallet or not, right? But what happens when that first fight starts on the end of the street, there's actually not, not many blows exchanged. They just, they, the girl, somebody puts, somebody puts the girl, the woman in a cab, and then Edward Soros, who's the first guy to reach there, he, he, he's a small, he's a small guy, and he winds up, you know, backed up to the T station by the by the Harvard guys, and the Harvard guys, there's actually no blows exchanged. They just kind of throw up their hands and say, "Let's let's get out of here." 
And that's when Edward Leon Easterling comes in and, and stabs, you know, and then, but at that point they run, they are like, you know, the equipment manager said, they've got knives. They run down the street to get, and then, and then they become chased. And then they get chased. And that's when, according to the judge's per- perspective, that's when things change. That's when it becomes they're in pursuit. Uh, they're, the medical testimony alone on, on, uh, on Popolo's injuries was incredibly damning. The case against Leon Easterling is airtight. And as, as Henry Owen, who represented Richard Allen, put it, he said, you know, Easterling should have gotten murder in the first degree. Soros, you know, we could have gotten him for, I don't know, assault and battery or, uh, you know, but Richard Allen bringing him into it with the level of their evidence was a little bit of a reach. And if, if he was white, would they have? I don't know. There's a, there's a fourth man who was involved. He's called, they call him the man with the cram, in the cranberry jacket because he, he joins the chase with, with the three of them and he's the first one to get there. And he's the one who pulls out, uh, Charlie Kane, he's the one banging him against the van. But he, he, they call him the man in the cranberry jacket because um, the testimony, some people like, identify him as a black man, some identify him as a white man, some identify him as a you know Hispanic man. Nobody can get his race straight. And he disappears, and he's never, he's never charged or found or, or ID'd. And um, Danny Popolo said, I wouldn't be surprised if he was Italian. Because, you know, we, like, that's why, you know, the mob owns the combat zone. That's why he never gets found or ID'd or, you know, or charged. I mean, I don't know if that's true. That's just a theory. At the end of the day, but do you think do you think justice was served um, with the trial, the first trial? No, I think it was harsh. I, I don't think, I don't think, I, I personally don't think the first verdict was, was, was fair. What, what do you think is, was unfair about the first one? Well, I think the problem with joint venture is that it's not applied fairly. Uh, after this case, there will be, there's a, there's a case of Brian Nelson. He is a young black man who was uh, like 18 years old and they got into a fight, three, three young black kids in a, uh, in a, in a car and a van full of white kids. Uh, he gets murdered. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a snowstorm and I think they spin out and they get into a fight. He gets murdered with a tire iron and a bo- broken bottle. In that case, not only are, None of the other one one boy is charged with and the boy is like nineteen is a former marine uh he's charged with um a manslaughter, not murder in the first degree, and nobody else is charged there's no joint venture in any of the big other people who were there and then he gets tried uh he he gets tried in an all white jury and he gets found innocent even though there is pretty strong testimony from his own people that he did it. So I think that, you know, the judge didn't even consider using joint venture because it's, it was a brawl, right? I mean, there isn't a lot of time to uh, think about premeditation. Now, in this instance, in that instance, they were kids. So these three black defendants are grown-ups. Uh, Easterling is 41. Uh, he's been a player in the combat zone for a while. Suarez is 33 and uh, Richard Allen are 36. And they were, you know, hustlers in the... Although, see, Edward Soros actually, he actually wasn't a hustler. He, he sold jewelry on a cart. He was just, but he was friends with the other two. So he, they got rounded up. Well, they were, you know, the, the, the prosecutor decided they were all hustlers, uh, because they were all black, uh, you know, they were all hustlers. They were all do, run the same scam. Although the evidence, I didn't think in the first trial was very, uh, on the, uh was very compelling that they were, um, working with that prostitute. Now, the second trial, they actually have better evidence, but in the first trial, it wasn't that compelling. Why did they go to a second trial, or was that like a, was it an appeal, or did something happen in the first? Yeah. So the reason that this case is, I think, really important is because of the appeal. Henry Owens knows from the beginning, because it's Judge Roy, because he can see the state, you know, because, because of all the furor over the combat zone. He, he doesn't think his, Richard Allen has it chance unless his case gets separated from the other two and the judge refuses to separate the cases so he he's convinced that his uh defendant has no chance so he begins from the very beginning to set up the appeal so in jury selection every time tom mundy uh, uses a peremptory challenge to strike a potential black juror he challenges it and he, and it's in the record he's challenging you know he's he's saying 
he's striking him because he's black. That does go to appeal. The the defense def- appeals the uh, verdict because they all three even get charged. I mean, the, the jury deliberates like half a day, 20 minutes the next morning. They come back with murder in the first degree on all three of them. And, and, you know, and the defense was pretty weak. I mean, they didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare. But so he appeals on the facts. You know, he, he, they say, look, none of these facts support premeditation. That, that There's that. And then even if they did, the jury selection was so rigged. You know, this they, there's obvious racism in the jury selection. So the high court comes back with, so he, so this is an they appeal probably in April of uh, seventy seven. Shortly before this, the, the appeals court has its decision, California comes out with a ruling on a similar case that says you can't do this. I think two months later, the high court says, "Look, we reject the appeal that on the on the evidence. Yes, the evidence does support premeditated murder, but because of the way the jury is selected, you got to go to trial again." And they write up new rules. It's called the Suarez decision on just how you can use your peremptory challenges. And the way it works is this. Right. It's not it's not that every juror has to have a have a, a black person in it or a uh, you know, any kind of minority group identified in it. It's just that you can't strike them. So if you have five blacks on the jury pool and you strike them all, you're really gonna be called into question. As a matter of fact, if there's only one juror, black person in the jury pool and you strike them, the other, the other side is going to say, I, I appeal, you know, and if you can't come up with a really good decision, your case, your thing is going to get overturned. You're going to have to retry it. So, um, the way it wasn't just, you know, color of your skin. It was, say it was a rape trial and you, and you used your, your, um, proper challenge to strike women, you know, that would be the other side. And they all start keeping track with the numbers. And the second trial is the first time they implement this new system. And from then on, there will be further refinements. And this will, this will lead to the Batson decision, the U.S. federal, the, the federal Supreme Court Batson decision, which changed things nationally. But, but the Batson decision isn't as well written or implemented as the state court is. The Soros decision in Massachusetts works better to, to, to fight, uh, discrimination. So, so how did it, uh, how, how was the outcome then? What, at the, at the end of the day, um, who ended up with what? Well, so usually when I when I give my speech on this, I make people buy the book with find that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but we can but uh, no. Uh, so things change. Uh, so there's a couple things that happen. This is where Boston's politics really uh, come into play. This is during busing, right? And at the beginning in '76, uh, this is when the, the the neighborhoods are just furious about busing. There's so much violence in the city. It's not like there's a, some racism going on. It's like there's a racial war. Uh, but the first time they released statistics, which is 78, there's something like 604 instances of black on white or white on black hate crime in a single year reported to the police. So they're, they're, they, they, during busing, you know, kids are getting stabbed in, in, uh, in the library. Uh, buses are being overturned. Like parents are, they're, they're throwing rocks at buses full of black kids. You know, and and the violence goes both ways, but in '77, I think it is between these two trials, the, the U.S. Justice Department releases a report that says, "Yeah, there's violence on both sides, but it's 60 percent white against black." The Boston Globe also comes out with a a one of its spotlight series, which says that blacks are getting sentenced longer sentences to worse prisons for the same exact crimes as white people. There's a case where these tourists come from. Uh, these black tourist school children come from uh, Pennsylvania, see Bunker Hill, uh, and while they're there, they uh, they get beaten with sticks uh, and uh, hockey clubs by some Charlestown residents. And uh, the, I mean, it's just it's just disgusting. The police come in, they get three suspects, and it goes to trial, and all three of them get acquitted by an all white jury. And, and actually, in that instance, it looks like problem happened at the police. The police work like they got three guys. When they got to trial, the the the, the victims are saying, "I don't know, I don't know, I can't, I can't." He doesn't look familiar. So it might have been they might have had the three wrong guys, but it, the optics of it are still horrific. So in this period of time, Boston's busing leaders, uh, Louise Day Hicks and uh, Pixie Paladino, they get voted out of office. The city is really kind of sick 
of all this violence. And, and another reason is, unfortunately, now that busing is once after two years of busing, all the white kids are gone from the school system. Their, their parents have either moved out to sub, the suburbs or they put them in parochial school. So uh, people are sick of the fighting, and there's nothing more to fight about. And so the fighting in the schools kind of um, wanes. It, it will go out into the neighborhoods. But people are sick of it. They're sick of the violence. And then two weeks before before the second Pablo trial, Daryl Williams, I think it's Daryl Williams, he's a 15-year-old black kid who's playing football on the Charlestown field with, with the high school team. And he gets shot from in his neck with, from three white kids on a on a rooftop. And he, Daryl Rogers, sorry, he will be, he'll be put into a coma. And at this point, it's, I think this is the tipping point where white violence against blacks has finally gone too far. Even in, in Charlestown, which is like one of the, at the point of that time, and, and, you know, Charlestown and, and Southie were very poor, poor neighborhoods with large uh, housing projects of white, white kids. This is where the violence was, was the worst. And Charlestown, was was really activist against this, but at this and and Charlestown is known for never giving up its own, and they actually people actually work to find these suspects, these three white kids, because they're even they're disgusted. And that trial, that event happens only weeks before the second Pablo trial. So in the news at that time is 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 Daryl's condition. He's still in a coma. It doesn't look like he's ever going to come out. He eventually does come out. He'll be paralyzed for the rest of his life, but. He does come out of the coma, but during this period of this trial, it doesn't look like he's going to make it. That has an impact on this trial. The defense attorney, lead defense attorney said, oh, my God, are you kidding? Of course it helped us. So sympathies were initially for the first, you know, the jury's impacted, I think, by a lot of the feelings about the combat zone initially. In the first trial and the second trial, I think they are, you know, impacted by a lot of what's going on in the city. And in that case, uh, they wind up, not only do they exonerate, uh, not guilty, you know, Edward Soros and, and Richard Allen, which is understandable, they they let Easterling off with manslaughter, which I think is criminal. So I, you know, I, I don't think either trial was So what, at the end of the day, what do you hope uh, a reader will pick, pick up and get out of the book? Well, for it's two things. One thing is a lot of people, for, even when I was researching this 40 years later, people would say to me, oh, the Popolo murder, that's that kid who got murdered trying to get his wallet back from that prostitute. And I would say, no, that's not what happened. So I really wanted to dispel that notion because when when a young person dies, people want to want desperately to believe there's a reason for it so that it won't happen to anybody they love. So the family is dealing not just with a tragic loss, but people saying to them, oh, I'm so sorry, but what was he doing in the combat zone that night? So I was hoping to eliminate the taint from the unfair taint from the victim. There's another thing. People, it went down as, oh, that racism, that Popolo thing, where Andy Popolo was actually the least racist kid on the Harvard football team. He was known for it both. He, he had a lot of black friends. He was often, often, um, you know, the black friends would say he was the one who crossed the line to include us, you know. And so, and he had nothing to do with the way the case was tried, obviously, you know. So I wanted to clear that up. And then the other thing that I think is is, is important, and, and I do think that this trial, you know, changed changed case history in a very important way. Uh, and then the other thing is there's Danny Popolo's personal story. He was 19 when this happened. The younger brother, he adored his older brother. And they're Italians. And they, you know, they grew up in the North End. And this is the shortly after the, uh, you know, the, the Godfather movie came out. And, you know, the whole idea of vendetta was almost noble. And he's 19, and people say, oh, look. And, and this is true. People say, there's never going to be a trial because the mob's going to kill them in prison. And, in fact, the, you know, the, those rumors were so strong, none of the media thought it was going to go to trial. And uh, the sheriff, where they were holding him, the jail, said, no, we've got everything secure. Don't worry. We have, they had to take extra security measures. And people would say to him, don't worry. It's never going to go to trial. And then it did go to trial, and they got their convictions. And then when it was appealed, they were actually, the father was actually offered as a gift to whack them in prison while they were waiting for appeal. And the f- father rejects that. And Danny is 19, and he starts to think it's his, it's his role to get that revenge. You know? His father's not going to do it. The mob's not going to do it. It's his job to get that revenge. This is 
where I learned through my research is really, it's, it's, it's a function of PTSD. Uh, and they know this from all the studies they did from all the gang violence in the 90s, in the late 80s and 90s, that when, when an adolescent sees somebody murder or, or, or witnesses a friend murdering, revenge is one of the most common, and they have PTSD, it's one of the most common symptoms. It's the reason for the cycle of violence in the cities. It's the reason there's all that gang warfare that, that never ends. And I would hope when people see this through the eyes of, of, of Danny Popolo, who is a very, very sympathetic character, um, from a very nice, very good upbringing. He goes, he's very religious. So he goes from like stalking them to church, you know, getting on his knees and begging for forgiveness. And, and, and when they see his struggle with revenge and understand how common it is, they might understand gang, gang violence a little bit more and have, have more understanding for the kids in the inner city. So now, um, where do people find you on social media, or do you have a website? Yes, I have a website, www.janbrogan.com. Uh, I am on Twitter, at Jan Brogan, and I am on Facebook. I think it's Jan Brogan 7 or 07. And I'm on Instagram as uh, Jan Brogan underscore. Okay, well, fantastic. Of course, we'll have that up on our website as well as your book. And we appreciate you here coming talking about the book, The Combat Zone, Murder, Race, and Boston's Struggle for Justice. Jan Brogan, thank you for being here. Thank you for having You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.